शशांक चतुर्वेदी फैकल्टी एट इज पटना सेंटर ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ सेंटर फॉर डेवलपमेंट प्रैक्टिस एंड रिसर्च टाटा इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ सोशल साइंसेज आई वेलकम यू ऑल टू जस्टिस लेक्चर सीरीज ऑर्गेनाइज टू थाउजेंड सेवेंटीन बाई द सेंटर पास्ट स्पीकर इन दिस लेक्चर सीरीज है स्टेट वायलेंस ट्राइबल राइट कंटेम्प्री वुमेन्स मूवमेंट एंड कास्ट इन कंटेम्प्री इंडिया सम ऑफ द की स्पीकर हर्ष मंदर रणबीर समादा तबेताची सज्जाद कल्पना कन्ना बीरन अमित प्रकाश एंड अदर्स दिस इयर डॉक्टर हिलाल अहमद इज विथ हर एंड ही विल स्पीक ऑन द आइडियाज ऑफ जस्टिस एंड पॉलिटिक्स ऑफ विक्टिमहुड इन इंडिया डॉक्टर अहमद इज एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर सेंटर फॉर स्टडी ऑफ डेवलपिंग सोसाइटी न्यू डेली He works on political Islam, Muslim politics of representation, and politics of symbols in South Asia. His first book, Muslim Political Discourse in Post-Colonial India: Monuments, Memory, and Contestation, which came from Rutledge in 2014, explores these thematic concerns to evolve an interdisciplinary approach to study Muslim politics. His volume, Siyasi Muslim: A History of Political Islam in India and Democratic Accommodation Minorities in Contemporary India. with peter de souza and sanjeev are came in 2019 further elaborate these themes his recent work include companion to indian democracy resilience resiliency and vivelance which recently came from rutledge it's co-edited with uh, peter de souza and sanjeev ralan ahmed is also currently working on a book project on the politics of muslim political representation in post colonial india he is also editing a hindi reader of sudeep takaraj's writing His recent research article Researching India's Muslim Identities Methods Politics in Journal of Ethnographic Theory deals with the issues doing research in social sciences now I'd like to formally invite professor Ahmed professor Ahmed it's up to you now uh thank you very much Shashank Pushpin ji and friends uh, <clears throat> in Patna uh it is actually a great honor for me to uh speak to you on something which i really uh, i have been actually exploring for a long time and uh, i thought that instead of focusing only on one aspect of uh, the idea of justice it would be good if we look at the changing meaning of the term called justice in relation to what we call politics what i need to do is basically to revisit this idea of justice through the prism of indian politics and at the same time i would also like to touch upon something called uh, something which is part of our popul uh, popular vocabulary uh, so basically there are two part of this lecture in the first part i would like to revisit the idea of justice in relation to what is called victimhood and in the second part i would like to go beyond the contemporary politics and think about the possible ways in which gandhi could offer us a framework to revisit these two these two ideas social justice as well as uh, the idea of victimhood uh, so these are the two basic objective i have at the moment uh, but my interest in the idea of victimhood actually goes back to uh, 1990s i started my career as a journalist and very early in my life in my professional life i learned a very uh, you know very strategic uh, reference point to interview a politician so the best thing to interview a politician is to listen to him or her and you realize that for first 10 to 15 minutes he would actually tell you about his or his or her own sangharsh so the point is that uh, whenever you talk to a politician of in any setting whether it is an interview or in a public delivery you find that there is a lot of info, info, emphasis on the struggle part of it and that struggle always comes to us in the form of victimhood so that is something which actually provokes me to revisit that is this something which is you know inextricably linked to our political culture or is it a, actually a vocabulary that is some there is actually this is actually a vocabulary that is coming out somewhere else so when i looked at the source of this idea of victimhood or the culture of victimhood 
I realized that Constitution of India has got something called the idea of social justice. So there is an interplay between social justice and the idea of victimhood, in uh, which actually constitute our political culture in a significant way. So these are the two things which uh, actually started uh, with which I started, and gradually I learned uh, that most of the time, and especially before uh, 2010, uh, or I would say even 2010 uh, tens, uh, that there is a lot of emphasis on Gandhi. So Gandhi comes to us in two different ways. On the one hand, there is a popular saying, Majburi ka naam Mahatma Gandhi. It is also something that underlines the idea of victimhood. But if we just closely look at Gandhi's politics, we find that he is not at all. In fact, he, is, uh, he has got this tremendous clarity between justice and victimhood. And that makes this task easier for me. So in today's lecture, I would touch upon these two things the idea of justice and victimhood and in what ways Gandhi would be useful. Uh, so when I say Gandhi, I would like to make it very clear that I do not want to be described as Gandhi Gandhi. I am not a Gandhi Gandhi at all. For me, Gandhi is actually a reference point. And this reference point is crucial because he has got a tremendous political clarity and his emphasis on action actually tells us many things which are relevant for our own context. So this is the basic background of the lecture which I'm going to deliver. Yeah. Uh, I would also touch upon a few things with regard to constitutional provisions, etc. And I would like to clarify that these are basically my readings and you are free to draw your own conclusions. Now, my final clarification is about the structure of this uh, presentation. Uh, there is uh, a flow in it, so I would like you to pay close attention, not to, merely to the argument which I am sharing with you, but also the trajectory of this argument, because the sequence of this argument is crucial and important. And uh, that would actually give you some kind of a vantage point to be critical to me. So uh, with these uh, uh, basic uh, preliminary remarks, I would like to share my screen. I have got a PowerPoint presentation uh, that would actually help us to revisit both of these ideas uh, uh, with regard to uh, Gandhi and social justice and uh, victimhood. I think you can see my screen now. Yes, yes. Okay, so. Now, this is something which I was talking about. Majburi ka naam Mahatma Gandhi. So, that would be our reference point throughout this discussion. Now, in this lecture, uh, I would like to, actually I have three objectives. The first objective is very simple. To make sense of the idea of contemporary victimhood in the realm of Indian politics. Second objective is to understand the sources that produce the discourse of political victimhood in, con in comparative sense. Uh, meaning that I would actually looking at different narratives of Indian politics and locate this idea of victimhood, political victimhood in these narratives. And finally, as I said, that there is an objective of mine to evoke Gandhi as a framework to go beyond the politics of victimhood. Uh, I think it would be better if I clarify my position with do and don'ts. So there are three don'ts in the presentation. As I said, that I do not want to worship Gandhi as if he had all the answers for all our problems. Secondly, I do not wish to refute Gandhi as if he was an accidental father of nation. So he is here and he would be with us as a reference point. And finally, uh, there is another don't. 
not i am not interested in reducing everything to the realm of history as if the present is nothing but a distorted image of me i am not saying that uh, you know the colonial india or the time when uh, gandhi was there uh, was the only time where we can draw inspiration etc past would certainly has got its own uh, conceptual value in this framework but at the same time the specificity of the present moment need to be taken very very seriously now uh so these are the don'ts the in terms of clarification uh i would also like to clarify a few terms which i am going to use in this presentation the first term which would come time and again is constitutionalism i use constitutionalism in two senses the first sense is the technical sense in my view the norms principle that not only create state institution but also impose certain limits and curb on them could be called constitutionalism and that's the normative uh, conceptualization of the term called constitutionalism in a broader sense but there is another sense in which the term constitutionalism could be used especially with regard to indian politics in my view political parties rely on the language of constitutionalism in the realm of electoral politics and they do two things on the one hand they continue to evolve ideologically suitable interpretations of the constitution and at the same time they also used to adhere to the given idea of constitutionalism as if that's the source of their politics so in that sense constitutionalism is used in these two ways the technical meaning of the term constitutionalism which is, which is all about limits on the state and second the political meaning of constitutionalism meaning how different political parties evolve their imagination of constitutionalism and used it in electoral politics uh there is a term that would come it is called hindu nationalism or hindu nationalist the organization that were ideological ideologically committed to declare india a hindu nation in post 1947 period and the in and their changing imagination of india in post 1950 india when they started uh participating in electoral politics so that is a broad conceptualization which i am going to use in this presentation and because the contemporary moment of uh indian politics hindutva is the dominant narrative so therefore there is a need to pay close attention uh, to these terms uh, the term hindutva is an interesting term uh, i use it uh, in the way in which vd savarkar would like us to use for him it's a political doctrine uh, which he uh, explained in his book uh, that was published in 1923 the term uh, hindutva found a new afterlife in 1997 when supreme court of india described it as a way of life and finally we find that the bjp the dominant party at the moment officially accepted it as a formal ideology in 1997 98 and finally uh, there is another uh, important idea which i am going to discuss in this presentation that's muslim presence uh, in my view muslim presence refers to various interpretative strategies that are used to accommodate muslims in different ideological configuration hindutva including hindutva framework by producing certain popular images and accept acceptable icons so these terms would come time and again in the presentation and i thought that it would be important for all of us to uh, be clear in what ways they are used uh, in order to make uh, an, a statement or an argument now i would like to start with the idea of it now there is a lot of literature on victimhood and it is actually seen um, in a variety of ways uh, and i would like to begin with the very basic textbook type of definition of victimhood it is said and it is defined a belief that one's own group has been intentionally undeservingly harmed by another group so basically this is the uh, fundamental 
definition of uh, the idea of victimhood which is often used to communicate a basic or preliminary meaning of this idea a belief that one's own group has been intentionally and undeservingly harmed by another group now i find in this definition three conceptual problems first belief in this case it is understood as a feeling that has no direct relationship with the discourse or context that produces it it means that a very uh, static conceptualization of the idea of belief is produced here second that the idea of group or community which is linked to this belief is given and is is uh, supposed to be given and fixed and finally this definition does not look at the political structure and processes that produce this belief and the imagination of the community or group which is supposed to be the victim of this idea of victimhood so therefore i think this textbook definition of victimhood is rather problematic now i would like to actually this uh, these three problems introduce us to a more nuanced understanding of what is called competitive victimhood daniel sullivan uh, and others they have worked extensively on this idea in us and uh, they actually uh, focus more on the psychological aspect of uh, self imagination of a group and they conceptualize the idea of victimhood in a competitive sense and uh, this argument i like uh, which is actually interesting argument it is said that a response to the moral social identity threat implied by accusation that one's group has committed illegitimate harm against an out group such accusation create an apparent moral gap between the in group and the out group whereby the accused in group appears morally inferior in comparison with the victim out group by claiming that the in group also suffer victimization relative to the out group this gap can be psychologically reduced now it is a in, this conceptualization is useful because in this case we can imagine a situation where a uh, victimhood is used as a category to make comparison and this comparison uh, you may find in our public life uh, even uh you know a lot of examples are given from our public life but i won't go into that but let us just you know clarify uh this conceptualization because this is very useful for the discussion which we are going to have today in this case uh two competing groups are blaming each other by evoking a similar set of moral values group a would say that i am the victim of group b and the group b would say no because on the moral uh, ladder we both are equal and we both have committed uh, atrocities against each other and therefore my atrocities the in group atro atrocities are higher than the out group so therefore uh the competitive victimhood is something that is not reducible it would always be uh it would always be there in a way that whenever a question of moral uh decline would come both the group would blame each other now if we look at uh this conceptualization uh, which is useful for our discussion we can also go back to the uh, recent violent uh, clashes between uh, you know especially with regard to lynching in case of lynching we find that initially when uh, lynching was highlighted as a new form of communalism against muslims a equally critical response also come up by arguing 
that lynching cannot be reduced to religion because there are other instances where the other communities also faced very similar kind of atrocities. So therefore, a comparative situation is actually produced. In this sense, uh, the victimhood is not reduced to any particular community, rather it is seen as a competitive uh, mechanism in which both the, both, both the groups are accusing each other for, uh, you know, for underlining the victim, the higher degree of victimhood they face. Now, this is the rather abstract thing. I think that this framework is important, but at the same time, it is problematic. Why this is problematic? Because of two reasons. First, if we just go back to this um, Daniel Sullivan type work, uh, we find that it is actually West centric and it does not pay attention to the specificity of our Indian context. So therefore, uh, it is obviously important, but at the same time, it should not be overstressed to analyze the issues which we confront. Secondly, as I said, that although this framework analyzes the form of collective victimhood, it does not pay attention to the production of victimhood as a political discourse. Remember that victimhood is actually a political discourse which in which the idea of justice is very central. So therefore, there is a need to contextualize it and try to locate different specific characteristic of victimhood as a political discourse in a concrete social political situation. And therefore, that's the reason why I got interested in Indian politics and the idea of victimhood. Now, in my view, uh, Indian constitution, as I uh, said in the beginning, is one of the most powerful source of Indian politics. Uh, and that's the reason why uh, we need to look at what kind of idea of justice is propagated by the constitution. Remember that the idea of victimhood is inextricably linked to idea of justice. So therefore, justice is a positive notion and extension of that notion in the real life situation can be interpreted as victim. Now, the source of this idea in post-colonial India is Indian constitution. I think that it would be great if we look at this. This is actually a very important uh, reference point for all of us, the preamble of the constitution. We all know that this preamble is actually a part of the constitution and at the same time it underlines certain crucial values. So I'm not going to glamorize the crucial values this uh, preamble actually highlights, but it is important to look at these moral value, moral political values as sources by which different political narratives are constructed. On the, if we look at Indian constitution from this point of view, I think three very interesting uh, articles would become crucial for all of us. First is article 15.4, uh, which says that this article, which is equality article, shall not, you know, this, this nothing in this article shall prevent the state from making any special provision for the advancement of any socially and educationally backward classes of citizen or for the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes. So therefore, uh, on the one hand, there is an emphasis on the idea of equality. And at the same time, we also recognize that there are some groups which are historically uh, not equal and therefore, this is actually the responsibility of the state to not only create an environment of justice, but also pay attention to the needs of deprived section of society. And in this case, the idea of affirmative action is not related to the idea of justice, but also an intervention is a state. So I'll come to this point later, the intervention is a state, but this is the basic meaning of the idea of justice 
which finds various very interesting political overtone in post-colonial Indian politics. So uh, obviously there is a director, the, the other important article is Article 155. Uh, we all know that uh, it's about, uh, you know, again, providing affirmative action to deprived sections. Uh, but the first or the, no, not the first, the third article of directive principle of state policy, where it categorically underline the moral values which are there, uh, moral values defining the idea of justice in a very interesting way. Uh, Article 38 says that state shall strive to promote the welfare of the people by securing and protecting as effectively as it may, a social order in which justice, social, economic, and political shall inform all the institution of the national life. So when we say institution of the national life, it does not mean institution that are governed by the state. So the social institution of national life should also be based on these moral values, social, economic, and political justice. So therefore, the Indian constitution defines the idea of justice in a very comprehensive manner. Now, if we just go back to these two and look at how political class interpret these constitutional values, remember that we should not glamorize the idea of justice given in the constitution. And we must remember what Ambedkar said, that it's a very nice constitution, but it won't work if we do not have political morality of a different kind. So I think that, you know, that lack of political morality is something very important and crucial. But at the same time, it would be great if we look at how these ideals of justice are interpreted in the realm of actual politics. In my view, we can actually uh, look at two expressions of this politics of justice in two very clearly identifiable phases. The first phase is 1952 to 1990. Why I'm saying 1990? Because it's a crucial turning point in the, uh, I would say a watershed moment in Indian politics, not merely because uh, of the, you know, the rise of uh, secularism versus communalism debate, but also around that time, the state started, uh, you know, uh, rolling back from the idea of welfareism, etc. I'll come to that point later, but look at the initial phase of Indian politics. Uh, the state, actually, that was an interventionist state. And the political class in this period defined itself as an agency to achieve social justice and economic equality. And that's the reason why the idea of justice is defined purely in terms of nation building. So nation was nation building was seen as a comprehensive project for achieving social justice and uh, political class define itself as the instrument by which uh, the idea of justice through nation building can be achieved. Uh, if you want, I can come back to this point later in the discussion, but I think that more or less we just agree on this point. The second phase started, as I said, in 1990, in my view, because the state actually decided to roll back from the economic life, whatever the control it had. And uh, in the free market, at, because you know, the, in constitution imagination, when constitution was uh, written and implemented, we must remember that constitution was actually an outcome of a movement. And that's the reason why it was inevitable for the constitutional maker to give more power to the state to intervene and to do, uh, to provide a, some kind of a responsibility to create a society uh, where economic, social and political justice can be achieved. So therefore, uh, some kind of a responsive, responsive state what they, was there. If we, even now, if we look at the constitution, uh, and clearly look at the ways in which the idea of state is defined in the constitution, we find that there is an emphasis on the idea of responsive state. But political class actually redefined itself in the post-1990 period, when uh, a different kind of role is assigned to the state. 
and that role was of a mediator to resolve the conflicting interest of different group. So the society state distinction is evoked rather differently in the post 1991 period. And here, society is seen as, uh, you know, uh, as amalgamation of different groups. These groups might have different conflicting interests, and the role of the state is to actually mediate between these two conflicting groups, including uh, the market as well as society. Now, if we just closely look at the outcome of this, uh, outcome of this new interpretation of state, we find a new sectoral approach uh, that is adopted to produce a very different idea of sector-wise welfareism. So if we closely look at what re has really happened in post-1990 period, uh, we find that uh, different segment of society are marked different, uh, I would say, different marginalized community and groups, I would say segment, are marked and differentiated from each other. And uh, some way or the other, the interconnection between these marginalized sections and sectors are not given adequate attention as if that their interests are different from the other group. So, for instance, uh, Muslims would Muslim interests are defined, and that's the reason why this is what I call academic politics. We find that you know number of different commissions were constituted by the state to look at the relative marginalization of different sectors. So, such a commission report for Muslims, Rangnath Mishra Commission report for um, religious and cultural minorities. Similarly, we have got um, various commissions and programs for women, tribal, and similarly, Dalit. as if that these categories are homogeneous, different from each other, and this is the task of the state to actually not to do welfareism in the comprehensive interconnected manner, but to address them to do a bit of charity. So it's a different state. It's not a welfare state, but rather a charitable state. So these two imagination of state also define the idea of justice. Uh, let us just look at three moment when this idea of justice is translated into victimhood. The first moment is 1950, which I called the constitution moment because the constitution was seen as a reference point or the framework to refashion political identities. Uh, I can give you two very you know, provocative examples. One is Maulana Azad, who advised Muslim to not to be worried about because they constitute second majority in 40s. And now in the 50s, he said that there is a need to embrace a new language of minority rights. In a way, he also evoked minority right as a tool to underline in the later year what I call Muslim victimhood. Very similarly, uh, Hindu nationalists who were actually talking about Akhand Bharat in 47 or Hindu Rajta, etc., they also changed their position. And they also started, you know, talking about the protection of Hindu interest in 50s. So therefore, Muslim interest, Hindu interest, etc., that's the first narrative. Uh, in the backdrop of comprehensive nation, uh, nation, national development, somehow paved the way for uh, the, the. This was the actually beginning when the idea of social justice is begin to be seen as some kind of a victim. So I just gave you two examples of the first moment. The second moment, uh, I would say that uh, begin in 1990s when exclusion social exclusion, redefined as victimhood. Uh, the idea of social justice, as, seg as I said, as a segmented group specific phenomena was redefined. Uh, I'll give you one very interesting example. Uh, the idea of permanent national religious minority was something that was actually uh, context co conceptualized and legalized in the 90s. So if you want, I can come back to uh, this point that how the idea of national religious minority was, which is actually not the case in the 50s, uh, 1950s to 1990, uh, actually redefined 
the uh, entire discourse of Indian politics and pave the way for new politics of Muslim victimhood and Hindu victimhood. I'll come to this point later, but I have already explained to you that it is very important uh, that we need to look at this inclusion exclusion debate from the point of view of uh, the politics of victimhood. Now, finally, I think that the contemporary moment is crucial. And in my view, contemporary moment does not start with 2014, because this is now a tendency that we reduce everything to 2014, as if that was the watershed moment. I don't think that it was the case, uh, because the change, the, the, the change in the narrative of politics started in 2010, uh, when uh, anti-corruption movement was launched. So interestingly, uh, as I said, that there are three very interesting features of this moment, a very well-defined framework of Hindutva victimhood produced in reaction to the established notion of Muslim victimhood. Uh, at the same time, we find that Hindu victimhood is established as a new political common sense, and the entire political class has accepted it. And finally, if we again closely look at the contemporary moment, uh, now it's complete, uh, it is now more than 12 year old. Competitive victimhood has been accepted uncritically to evaluate every social phenomena, including violence. So I think the hijab rock is something which is the recent example. So it is on the one hand, uh, look at the debate. Debate is always in a binary. So if you want, I can come back to this point later. But what is interesting is that the acceptance of competitive victimhood uncritically by the political class is something which is important at the moment. So now I would move to the second part of my presentation. And that is Gandhi as a framework. As I said that I'm not a Gandhiwadi, rather for me, Gandhi is an important reference point uh, to understand uh, or to think beyond this idea of victimhood. But Gandhi is a problematic figure for three reasons, because it is important that how should we talk to him. Uh, and I find three problems uh, while talking to Gandhi. First is that he would celebrate his inconsistency. He would say, and I think I quote uh, him, he said, I would like to say to the reader, and you know, this is the famous quote, which you find virtually in every um, you know, book published by Navjeevan of Gandhi, that this is actually something which he always admired. And I think this is very crucial clarification by him to all of us. He would say that I would like to say to the reader that I am not at all concerned with appearing to be consistent. Therefore, when anybody finds any inconsistency between any two writings of mine, do well to choose the letter of the two on the same subject. Uh, so I think that's the first thing which we must remember that and that's the reason why uh, when I revisit the Gandhian idea of Satyagraha, I selected, uh, I, I, I take this idea of inconsistency as a reference point to select his later writing on the subject, not the earlier one. Uh, this is also reflected uh, and we also remember that actually Hinswaraj is the only text which he said he actually uh, abide by. Even in 1938, he said that I do not want to change it at all. So on the one hand, he's saying that uh, I prefer inconsistency, but at the same time, only one text he said that I would like to retain. So I would give adequate attention to Hinswaraj to think both the ideas, victimhood and social justice. And finally, I think whenever we think of Gandhi, we always and we should we must pay close attention to the idea of taxes. He said that my writing should be criminated with my body. What I have done will endure, not what I have said and written. Now, this praxis is crucial. So whenever we talk to, talk to him or talk to Gandhi, I think these three things must be remembered as a point of departure. Uh, I think that we must revisit the idea of Satyagraha. Now, it, it is actually because um, we are celebrating, last year we celebrated um, 
150 years of Gandhi, and this year we are celebrating 75th year of India's independence, uh, and everybody is talking about Satyagraha. So I have decided to revisit the idea of Satyagraha in order to understand the competitivity. I would like to clarify that this is my selection, not Gandhi's. So the theory of Satyagraha, which I am proposing here, it's based on my interpretation of Gandhi, not Gandhi's theory of Satyagraha. So it is actually an interpretation. I have actually selected four or five different uh, segment of Satyagraha, which are here and there, and provide, a, uh, I would say, a, a provide a coherence to these different ideas from the point of view of the question which I have clarified in the beginning. So, uh, yeah. It is important that uh, Gandhi uh, <clears throat> never, he, he was freely, he, he used Hindu and Muslim communities as terms rather freely. And in my view, instead of underlining the sociological plurality of these entities, he raises the foundational principle by, by which Hindu and Muslim identities are constituted. These foundational principles are not based on religious text or doctrine. Rather, he evokes the moral aspect of them that determine the practice of everyday conduct as Hindu and Muslim. And this, this clarification is important because whenever we look at the question of Hindu victimhood or Muslim victimhood, I think uh, we have to be very clear about the ways in which, unlike others, remember that Gandhi perhaps the only uh, nationalist leader um, or thinker, in my view, that who would not celebrate the diversity of these uh, communities. Gandhi does not celebrate diversity of Hinduism or uh, Islam. Uh, rather, he would actually question the internal making of these communities or these categories. And therefore, that's the reason why uh, his Satyagraha imagination can be useful to understand the perceived victimhood which we find uh, at the moment as the dominant uh, discourse of Indian politics. Uh, now, this is something which, let me just quickly start, what is the meaning of Satyagraha? So Gandhi says, truth implies love, and firmness. So that Satyagraha is actually made of two things, Satya and Agraha. Truth implies love and Agraha means firmness, engender and therefore serve as synonymous for force. I thus begin to call the Indian movement Satyagraha, that is to say the force which is born of truth and love or non-violence and it gave up the use of the phrase passive resistance. So it is very important that uh, Gandhi himself was uh, very clear that uh, Satyagraha is not passive resistance. It is an active force in which there are two elements. One is truth and second is firmness. So what I believe or I imagine uh, as truth, I must adhere to it firmly. And this firmness would become uh, my Satyagraha. Now, if we just look at this conceptualization of Satyagraha and place it in our own context, I think it answers the question which we were raising at the beginning, that uh, it is not uh, uh, some kind of a victimhood, uh, the competitive victimhood, where it is said that I am a victim of something uh, on the moral moral letter. At the, in, in this case, that I am not a victim, rather I believe that whatsoever is happening with me as an individual or as a part of a group, I think is wrong. And this wrong assertion uh, is not victimhood, rather it's a truth. And I uh, accept it with my full firmness. Now, what is, and therefore, if that this is the, this, this distinction between passive resistance and Satyagraha is useful, 
i think it would be better if we just unpack this idea more systematically so what is not satyagraha and what is satyagraha from gandhi's point of view first of all gandhi would say a strategic move taken by a political group to achieve a larger objective cannot be called a satyagraha he would say an individual quest for exploring internal truth would become a satyagraha second as i said that passive resistance or weapon weapon of the weak is not a satyagraha gandhi would say that satyagraha is weapon of the strongest and exclude the use of violence in any shape or form uh, so actually politics of victimhood is always uh, define the in group or the group that is uh, the self perception of the group is most of the time defined as if that they are weak in gandhian imagination uh, satyagraha is actually the weapon of the strongest meaning you have to assert if you feel that something is bad is happening with you you have to assert yourself now here in this case the assertion is violent but this assertion is always defined in terms of competitive victimhood and as a reaction to something so if you look at most of the hindu muslim conflict in contemporary india you find that the justification is given uh, um, in relation to what i called uh, action reaction theory so the first action uh, by the other group is seen as a provocation and the reaction to is justified that actually we we were the victim morally and therefore there is a need to justify it because we just reacted to this in gandhian framework it is actually there is no place for this action reaction he would say that even if i feel that something bad is happening with me i am i feel strongest and i actually do satyagraha in order to assert that this is not acceptable and that's the third thing brute force and the sole force or love force gandhi would say satyagraha is not a brute force if you look at the politics of victimhood uh, brutality is something which is always celebrated so even the lynching is justified which is a very brutal thing gandhi would say satyagraha is a soul force or love force in today's context soul force or love force are seen as you know these are meaningless or you know it these are irrelevant uh, phrases but in my view if we closely look at the possibility of alternative politics in the indian context i think we need to revisit these idea of soul force and love force because there is a resentment among the people but this resentment can only be translated into political action of some kind if a positive interpretation of politics is given to them finally for gandhi satyagraha is not irreligious for him satyagraha is a belief in truth and truth is god so uh, we must remember that it does not mean when gandhi says irreligious for him a person who does not believe in the idea of god is also a believer of some kind for him the for him or her the idea of truth is very comprehensive so in that sense the ultimate idea of truth which we cannot define but always imagine uh which is right which is a very clear you know which is very difficult to define but we know that what is right and what is wrong in a given situation so determining what is right and wrong in a context for gandhi is a religious action or the truth is god uh, conceptualization so therefore for gandhi satyagraha is uh, basically a belief in that truth which is uh, which is an adversary to the collective wrong of the society so therefore uh, this is this is what in my view uh, gandhi's responses to the misleading notion of satyagraha because now it has become very fashionable for our political class to do satyagraha every political party does satyagraha but i think it is very important that we pay attention to gandhian imagination of satyagraha uh let us just now i would like to underline five different meanings of satyagraha which i called features of satyagraha uh, in order to refute the contemporary politics of victimhood the first point is about an internal quest uh 
Satyagraha, Shashank, we have time, isn't it? Uh, yes, yes, you can take some more time. Uh, maybe next uh, maximum 10 minutes so that we have time for yeah, yeah, discussion sure, sure. also. Yeah, yeah. I, I would actually uh, stick to seven or eight minutes. I'll, I'll okay, finish that's these, good. These five. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the first thing is that uh, it's an internal quest um, in a book by Gandhi Satyagraha in South Africa. Gandhi very categorically said, the very nature of Satyagraha is such that the fruit of the movement is contained in the movement itself. Satyagraha is based on self-help, self-sacrifice and faith in God. So it is basically an internal quest, not an external one. So I am not a hero who is going to sacrifice life on behalf of others. This is for me and I'm doing it for, the, for my own sake. Uh, the, if you are interested, you know, there is uh, probably the only, I think probably the first interview Gandhi gave uh, to an uh, American television company and it's on YouTube. So this person asked a number of questions to Gandhi and the final question was uh, that would you like to sacrifice your life for India's freedom movement? Gandhi stopped for a while and said it's a wrong question and a very stupid question. Now the question is that this response by Gandhi is very crucial to understand the internalization of politics. So whatever we do, I think it is very important that we internalize it in a way that it would become our own task uh, or our own objective or our own worldview for uh, the life which we live. Now, second thing with regard to the uh, Satyagraha, which uh, I am taking it from Young India, uh, 1930, is the universal applicability of this form of uh, Satyagraha, this form of uh, form of politics, uh, I would say. He said that Satyagraha to be genuine may be offered against one's parent, against wife or one's children, against ruler, against fellow citizen, even against the whole work. Such a universal force necessarily makes no distinction between kinsmen and stranger, young and old, man and women, friends and foe. Love does not burn others, it burns itself. Therefore, a Satyagraha will joyfully suffer unto, even unto his death. Now, universal. This is the universal aspect of it. Now, the question is that if everything is Satyagraha, then what to be, what, in what ways it is different from other forms of resistance? Gandhi said that love force and the opponent. So, the idea of opponent is defined here. Gandhi says a Satyagrahi must never forget the distinction between evil and the evildoer. He must not harbor ill will or bitterness against the latter. He may not even employ needlessly offensive language against the evil person, however unrelieved his evil might be. For it should be an article of faith with every satyagrahi that there is none so alien in the world but can be converted by love. Now this is very relevant at the moment. Uh, if you look at the narrative that is the dominant narrative of Indian politics at the moment, Everything is revolving around a few person or personalities. And that's the reason why there is nothing, there is virtually nothing on the ideas which we find uncomfortable with. So therefore, Gandhi would say that there is a need to define your uneasiness. There is a need to be very clear why you are opposing someone. And when you oppose someone, not the person, but the act, the, which uh, by you know, the act this person has done. So I think if the act is important, then the person would become irrelevant. So therefore, in Gandhian framework, uh, there is one thing is conversion of people by love. And second is that the act is more important than the person. This is the third aspect of the features uh, of Satyagraha. Now, conditions for Satyagraha. First, Satyagraha in the last instance. Gandhi would say that Satyagraha never adopted abruptly and never till all other milder methods have been tried. So this answers the question which I was raising that we need not to, you know, again, all, all uh, out of, uh, you know, out of blue started 
uh, start satyagraha as if that you know nothing before that or after that i think we have to evaluate the situation especially the political class and then think closely the possibility to launch a satyagraha or not self realization as i said that this is for us to realize that what is wrong and what is right a person who claims to be satyagrahi always tries by close and prayerful self introspection and self analysis to find out whether he is himself completely free from the taint of anger ill will and such other human infirm in infirmities whether he is not himself capable of those very evils against which he is out to lead a crusade now you have to define that whatsoever you are opposing uh, is something that you do not embrace or accept i think this clarity is very very crucial because only then you would be able to create um, an alternative to the process which you are opposing uh, you are opposed to what is the purpose of that he said that it is always important that satyagraha cannot be resorted for personal gain but only for the good of others a satyagraha should always be ready to undergo suffering and pecuniary loss it means that suppose if you if a satyagraha is launched against one's parent i think the act of the act of parent in the larger sense of the term must be defined for kadi in this case the fourth thing is public opinion a satyagrahi must first mobilize public opinion against the evil which he is out to eradicate by means of a wide and intensive vegetation when public opinion is sufficiently roused against a social abuse even the tallest will not dare to practice or openly to lend support to it an awkward and intelligent public opinion is the most potent weapon of a satyagrahi now this is very important it's a, it is called that creating a favorable and conducive environment to doing politics in indian politics if we closely look at that moment uh, the public not, there is nothing on public opinion public is public opinion is actually um, misled or constructed for you know sectorial benefits so therefore uh public on opinion of a right kind is completely missing and that's the reason why no political party is interested in what they used to what is what you know what was used to be called political education finally social ostracism meaning the boycott when a person supports a social evil in total disregard of a unanimous public opinion it indicates a clear justification for his social ostracism but the objective of social ostracism should never be to do injury to the person against whom it is directed it means that social boycott is important but the social boycott because of certain acts not because of certain individual let me summarize this if we just go back to the question which we have underlined in in in, in the initial part of the presentation i think it is important that uh, this revised imagination of satyagraha can answer them first the first stage is timing the question is do we need satyagraha of this kind at the moment so gandhi would say satyagraha should be used in the last instance secondly the internalization third is who would do this do we need leaders to do satyagraha and finally how should we do political mobilization uh, in the context where competitive victim who victimhood is dominated and finally what would be the role of social action uh, i'm not going to explain these things because i have already uh, you know uh, clarified what i mean by them uh, let me just you know make three quick points about uh, the questions which i have initially raised contemporary politics of competitive victimhood is a product of post colonial political processes i have already tried to uh, clarify this secondly in my view gandhi offers us a framework to understand and explain this phenomena which i have tried and finally gandhi is also useful 
to reconstitute our political imagination and the idea of justice. So I think, you know, the purpose is to take a historical figure or a historical, uh, I would say, intellectual history of certain ideas and try to think through them to revisit the question which we are encountering at the moment. So I think if we do that, then we would be able to produce um, or recognize the emerging meaning of justice uh, in our own context. So I stop here and thank you very much. Thank you, Professor uh, Hilal Ahmad. My name is Charvak. I'm a colleague of Sasang's. Uh, Sasang had to leave for some urgent work. So I'll be moderating the uh, rest of the session. So uh, we'll take up some questions first and then you perhaps like respond them or one by one you would like to go. Sure. Couple of questions and then perhaps you can uh, go ahead. So yes, we are now open for questions and answers, comments. Uh, let me invite uh, first uh, Professor Shiv Prasad. Uh, please unmute yourself, uh, Professor Shiv Prasad. Thank you. I, I, I really enjoyed the talk. It is a uh, very critical uh, analysis of uh, uh, Gandhian uh, approach to the Chagraha and the contemporary approach to the Chagraha. Uh, but my, uh, I am still confused with regard to uh, in the present uh, uh, political context, how do we uh, uh, tackle uh, using Gandhian approach to uh, you know to the kind of uh, uh, things that are happening today in terms of uh, the uh, you know the wave uh, uh, all all kinds of uh, uh, you know atrocities against the minorities and others. Uh, if Gandhi would have been there. Uh, do you think he would be he would have used the same methodology to tackle it or how it would be otherwise? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, because this is a very important and comprehensive question. I think if we collect other question and then I'll come back come, because this is the most important question for me. Sure. So uh, we I have now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We have a hand raised. Uh, uh, Mohammed. Samuel Azim, right? Yes. Uh, yes. Good yes, afternoon, go sir. Good afternoon, yeah. sir. Yeah, good afternoon. afternoon. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, I am extremely pleased uh, by the way you have presented the entire thing, justice, victimhood, etc., in a very lucid way. And, uh, sir, my question is related not only with India, but uh, with uh, India subcontinent. Respected sir, victimhood or rather propaganda about victimhood has uh, led to injustice or violence throughout Indian subcontinent. Uh, and uh, it has led to mob lynching, etc., etc. I am telling subcontinent respected sir simply because there are some organization in india in pakistan in uh, bangladesh if i give example of bangladesh in bangladesh there is so called uh, organization or philanthropic organization called hepajote islam by the name uh, it indicates that they are the custodian of Islam and they are propagating the idea that Islam is in danger. So we have the responsibility of protecting Islam. Same type of organization in several sub, uh, Indian subcontinent are uh, doing some propaganda or expounding the propaganda in the name of victimhood. Sir, 
what is your take on this cell thank you thank you very much thank you uh then we have a question by jivika um yeah i can i can uh, put the question forth <clears throat> so sir my question is that uh, so uh i mean uh, the current system the way it is designed and by the system i mean the government <clears throat> uh there's a lot of power that has been concentrated by design and uh, you know over a period of many years that the power to uh, you know execute things that has been concentrated within uh, you know the system there itself and uh, now let's say that if we are to ensure social justice as what was being discussed how would the constitution need to evolve over you know the next few years uh, so that uh, you know uh, let's say that the legislature and the executive can effectively ensure uh, you know the carrying out of the social justice thank you thank you uh, uh professor ahmed can i just read out a question from the chat box or perhaps yeah yeah then i'll respond to these four and then we'll take another yes, yeah sure, sure. so there is a question from kathinka sena hmm. uh, so uh, i'm just reading it out so my question hmm. concerns the basis on which you have divided the timeline in three categories of major change could you elaborate on 1990s in indeed the start of liberalization of the market that causes a different role of the state mm-hmm. but this is different from the basis of the third period which is not a change in the political economy of india true 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 how yeah. did the state's role change after 2010 and uh, the role of the state in present day debate on victimhood so mm-hmm. these are the four questions we have right now okay yeah thank you very much uh, very thought provoking questions and uh, i think i would uh, respond to these questions in the reverse order uh, kanika sena uh, sena's question is important uh, actually i'm working on the idea of dominant narratives in indian politics and in my view there are four dominant narratives of indian politics uh, which can easily be divided into four different phases the first narrative is socialism nation building and socialistic pattern of society it continued it started in 52 and continued to uh, survive till 9 till late 80s when i say political dominant political narrative meaning that the narrative that would provide the basic structure to different competing competing ideologies and in what ways these ideologies are using that vocabulary so if you look at all political parties everyone was socialist at that time even in the 50s and 60s look at their manifestos you do not find any stark distinction between say communist socialist even rightist uh, that they they disagree with the uh, with the idea that nation building is a, is not important socialism is not important even if even if now even now if you go to bjp's manifesto it says that they are there to gandhi and socialism so socialism was something that was the dominant narrative from 1950 to 19 late 90s this narrative is replaced you know very quickly uh, in early 80s and 90s by the second narrative that was secularism and communalism so everyone was secularist even the bjp would say that they are real secularist because the others are pseudo secularist so secularism was a dominant narrative the second dominant narrative the third dominant narrative was inclusion and exclusion this narrative began in year 2000 and it survived for next 10 years and this inclusion exclusion narrative everyone would say that they are excluded and finally the 2010 movement is the fourth narrative when nationalism has made a tremendous comeback so you know on the basis of these four narrative i have decided that it would be better if we revisit the idea of victimhood and i find that the role of state not the role of state but the idea of social justice is interpreted in these three different moments the first moment obviously 1950 to 1990 1990 moment um, when the victimhood is defined in terms of social justice so i am including the socialistic pattern of society socialism secularism and inclusion in the first phase 
The second is obviously you are right, 1990 moment when the state started rolling back and we have a different uh, state. It is actually not a welfare state, but in my view, a charitable state. But the extension of charitable state in such a way that it would become a nationalist state is 2010. Then if you look at the, uh, you know, the policy formulation of 20, uh, from 20, 2000 to 2010, and revisit 2010 till now, you find that the state is, the, the nature of state has completely changed. So at the moment to uh, make a comment on your final point is basically that the contemporary state is a charitable state. So Shubriya Modi ji, Shubriya Kejriwal ji, the poster actually, even though these are the obviously the responsible, responsible providing vaccine to people is the responsibility of the state. But the political class would interpret it and defines it in a different way because the nature of the state is completely changed. It's a charitable state. So in a charitable state, you benevolence is celebrated. And that's the reason why the 2010 narrative, 2010 moment is important because that actually marks a very crucial uh, you know, departure. Okay. Now, sir, I come to Shwenji, I come to this point. Uh, let me let me see because I think I missed something. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. I, I okay. Now, yeah. the second is Divika ji. Your question is important, uh, crucial for me. That uh, it is crucial for two reasons. That uh, and I think that. <coughs> If you just closely go back to the argument I am making uh, in this presentation is basically I am making two different set of things. One is uh, what is, meaning that we analyze what is and then the second part is what could be the possibility to think through someone called Gandhi. Now, if your question is important, that constitution needs to be evolving, how, how it could be. Uh, I think that to who we are, do we have any control over the legislative discussions that are done in the name of people? No, we don't. So in this context, uh, it would be important for all of us to observe the changing nature of legislative intervention, the manner in which certain laws are passed in say last 10 years. And remember, do, we should not reduce everything to the BJP as if that BJP is killing democracy. Remember, if you go back to the Anna movement and at the time when Mr. Kejriwal was not the chief minister of Delhi, uh, uh, and remember that uh, there was a demand that Lokpal must be passed. In, I think, various interviews, he said, we don't need parliament. He said that everything is done and dusted. You just get this done. Now, the deliberately, you know, the, the uh, disregard to the deliberative aspect of legislative bodies actually started long back. And that's why 2010 moment is very crucial. So I think for all of us, it is very important to carefully look at the ways in which legislative functions are done. So that's my response to your very innovative question. Uh, Samuel Azim, this is also okay, very a crucial. Follow up question on this one. Uh, can I just, you know, answer this and then I'll no. come back to you? Not a worry. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Samuel Azim, this is something which is obviously I agree with you that it is, uh, it is a very important phenomenon of the subcontinental politics. I agree with you. Now, uh, someone would say that protection, protecting Islam and protecting Hinduism. I think you are right and you got me right because this is what I am trying to underline. Now, what would be our attitude or what would be our response to this sort of thing is obviously uh, revisiting the idea of Satyagraha and this links to uh, Shiv Prasadji's question, which is a very important question. And I would club both of these. Uh, 
Uh, I think that uh, in my view, we should not expect that anybody would come from above and remove all the problems or we should go back and uh, start our search for a new Gandhi. No, Gandhi and Ambedkar, they have, you know, they have done their work. They have provided us a framework. Now there are two possibilities. One possibility, and because we all are academics, so we can only answer these things in our own language, which is academic language and intellectual language. And this intellectual language is crucial because remember that uh, Gandhi, Ambedkar, and uh, others, they were not uh, doing any, they were not writing research papers. They were doing public intellectualism, which is something that is completely missing in, 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 our, uh, in our context. Why? Because public intellectualism is actually political correctness. Unfortunately, our public those who are recognized as public intellectual, they're politically correct. They have got a set position and they do not go beyond that. Now, this is my worry. <clears throat> if we follow Gandhi, then there is a possibility to go beyond this. And when I say Satyagraha, it's an intellectual Satyagraha in my view, that we should, what's, what is our hand? Obviously, no, but no one has us to actually get rid of this web of victimhood and start a fresh thinking about the issues which we confront in our everyday life. So if, Gandhi, if I follow Gandhi, then my Gandhian answer, my, my interpretation of Gandhian answer would be that if I start getting rid of the dominant interpretation that is given to me, then there is a possibility to start an alternative discourse. So if we start conversing with each other in a different political language, obviously new kind of political action would certainly emerge because conversation is also somewhere or other is a political action. So this is my response to uh, Shri Prasadji and Samir Nazim Sahib. Uh, I now go back to the question which uh, Jivika ji has asked and I read it out now. Uh, it is said that uh, how do we ensure by design and constitutionally that citizen, citizen participate in governance not just once in five years through election. Obviously, yes. Uh, I think that I agree with you uh, that, you know, citizens participation, and this is what I just responded to. Uh, as a citizen, obviously, we have right to vote, etc. But no one has stopped us to actually converse with each other in a different political language. And if we go back to, we must internalize that something is wrong. This language of political correctness is unacceptable. Therefore, we need a new language. And this new language would come from our creative engagement with reality. Unfortunately, we do not have that creative engagement with reality. So if we do a bit of creative re-engagement with uh, our reality, for instance, the recent hijab thing, uh, everyone actually reducing this thing to Hindu Muslim because that's the acceptable binary to this is acceptable binary available to us. So quickly it would become a Muslim issue or a Hindu issue, etc. But if we just, you know, uh, just sit down, close our eyes and think, think very carefully, I think this is not a matter of religion. It's a cultural question. Because in Indian context, it is a cultural question, not a religious question, because religion is always interpreted in cultural terms. So therefore, uh, if we just start thinking in that direction, then there is a possibility to construct a different language. Now, my problem is that we are so committed to the politically given and political, uh, with which we call politically correct language, some way or the other, we fail to go beyond the established idioms of politics. There is a question by Asa in the chat box, but we can invite her. Yeah. Asa? 
can you unmute yourself in case yeah. he can't yeah okay yes जी जी मेरा जो सवाल था वो बहुत ही बेसिक सा सवाल है चूंकि हम एकेडमिक लैंग्वेज में इस सारी प्रक्रिया को समझने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं तो क्या हम मेथडोलॉजिकली रीजन को एक एनालिटिकल uh, कैटेगरी बना सकते हैं uh, जब हम इस मुद्दे के बारे में सोचते हैं क्योंकि विक्टिमहुड के बारे में सोचना क्या पूरे राष्ट्रीय स्तर पे एक समान होगा या फिर अलग राज्यों में अलग इलाकों में अलग अलग तरह के मूवमेंट्स हुए हैं अलग अलग तरीके से लोगों ने रेजिस्ट uh, किया है तो क्या हम रीजन uh, को फोरग्राउंड कर सकते हैं एक एनालिटिकल कैटेगरी के रूप में ये मैं समझने की कोशिश कर रही हूँ बहुत ही अच्छा सवाल है आपका और अगर मैं इसका जवाब हिंदी में दूं तो मुझे लगता है कि सभी की समझ में आएगा uh, कोई व्यक्ति हमारे बीच में शायद अगर होंगे तो मैं उसको अंग्रेजी में अनुवाद भी कर दूंगा uh, ये सवाल जो है ये देखिए जो मैंने uh, एक कोशिश की है गांधी को अलग तरीके से समझने की सत्याग्रह के जरिए तो वो केवल राष्ट्रीय स्तर पर सत्याग्रह के जरिए हम अपनी बौद्धिक बातचीत को सीमित नहीं कर सकते हैं बल्कि वो तो और भी नीचे जाएगा वो तो राज्य के स्तर पर भी जाएगा और वो और स्थानीय स्तर पर भी जाएगा बल्कि गांधी के शब्दों में कहा जाए तो व्यक्तिगत स्तर पर भी जाएगा तो अः पर जो राज्य है वो निसंदेह एक बहुत बड़ी श्रेणी के तौर पर उभरेगा हमें इस पूरे व्यक्ति मुठ की राजनीति को समझने के लिए दो उदाहरण मैं आपको देना चाहता हूं एक उदाहरण है यासर अराफात ने एक बहुत अच्छा आर्टिकल लिखा था केरल के ऊपर ये ईपीडब्ल्यू में आया था सदन हिंदुत्व उसका टाइटल ही है सदन हिंदुत्व तो हम ये मानकर चलते हैं कि हिंदुत्व की राजनीति जो है उत्तर भारतीय केंद्रित है वगैरह वगैरह राष्ट्रीय राजनीति है लेकिन हमको ये भी जरूर देखना चाहिए कि राज्य के स्तर पर जो डोमिनेंट व्यक्ति मुठ की राजनीति होती है वो कैसे परिलक्षित होती है उसके क्या वो हमेशा देखिए एक तो राष्ट्रीय विमर्श चलता है लेकिन राष्ट्रीय विमर्श क्षेत्रीय स्तर पर राज्य के स्तर पर और स्थानीय स्तर पर अपने नए मायने लेकर पैदा होता है तो बहुत सारे लोग ये कहते हैं कि वो जैसे चुनाव की लहर आ गई तो चुनाव की लहर नाम की कोई चीज होती नहीं है बल्कि केवल एक बौद्धिक प्रयास होता है कि जो बड़ी बात कही जा रही है राष्ट्र के स्तर पर वो राज्य के स्तर पर उसका अनुवाद कैसे हो और वो कैसे लोगों तक पहुंचे तो इसलिए ये श्रेणी तो बिल्कुल जो आप कह रही हैं बिल्कुल सही है इसमें दूसरा जो मेरा उदाहरण है वो है कि हम आखिर किस तरीके से दूसरा उदाहरण जो है वो जन आंदोलनों की राजनीति का है जन आंदोलनों की राजनीति विशेषकर एक आंदोलन जो कि जिस पर अक्सर बात नहीं होती और काफी बड़ा आंदोलन था जब भी हम जन आंदोलन कहते हैं तो हम सिमट कर रह जाते हैं नर्मदा बचाव आंदोलन पर नर्मदा बचाव आंदोलन की अपनी विशेषता है लेकिन मैं केवल उस तक उस पर नहीं जाऊंगा छत्तीसगढ़ मुक्ति मोर्चा मुझे बड़ा आकर्षित करता है शंकर गुहा नियोगी का आंदोलन था अस्सी के दशक का और उस आंदोलन में सबसे पहली चीज जो थी वो यही थी कि हम पॉलिटिक्स ऑफ विक्टिम नहीं करेंगे हम सकारात्मक राजनीति करेंगे और सकारात्मक राजनीति के लिए हमें भारत का जो संघवाद है उसको दोबारा से हमें परिभाषित करना पड़ेगा और इसीलिए अगर आप नियोगी की राइटिंग्स देखें तो उसमें वो एक बहुत अच्छी चीज कहते हैं कि आखिर छत्तीसगढ़ी कौन है तो छत्तीसगढ़ में ईमानदारी से काम करने वाला छत्तीसगढ़ी है छत्तीसगढ़ के अंदर रहकर जो शोषण के हर एक स्तर की लड़ाई लड़ रहा है वो छत्तीसगढ़ी है छत्तीसगढ़ के अंदर रहने वाला हर एक व्यक्ति जो कि वहां वहां पर रहने वाला हो और वो उसके विकास की ऐसी प्रक्रिया जिसमें कि पर्यावरण का नुकसान ना हो रहा वो छत्तीसगढ़ी वो सच्चा छत्तीसगढ़ी तो अगर हम ये देखें तो जन आंदोलन हमें बहुत सारी नई चीजें दिखाते हैं वो क्षेत्रीयतावाद के भी नए मायने दिखाते हैं अब होता यह है कि हम जब भी राज्य को एक श्रेणी बनाते हैं तो राज्य सिमट कर रह जाता है राज्य की राज्य में चलने वाली राजनीतिक पार्टी रीजनल पार्टीज तक रह जाता है लेकिन रीजनल पार्टीज के नीचे लाकर हमें राज्य राज्य के स्तर को देखने की जरूरत है जी थैंक यू थैंक यू सर देर वॉज वन क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम जीविका ही इज आस्किंग वेरी प्रैक्टिकल क्वेश्चन अबाउट दिस आम आदमी पार्टी 
uh, which wanted Mohalla Sabha and the LG office is preventing it. So he's asking, what's the way? <laughs> yeah, I think, Jivika, bhai, it's a very important question. Uh, mm-hmm. Again, then, you know, it could be answered in a different way. Uh, then we have to look at the political dynamics of uh, their Delhi's politics. Because I live in Delhi, I know that these there is interesting political dynamics. Uh, it appears that both BJP and uh, Ahmadmi Party, they have decided to uh, recognize the fact that they both have to survive in Delhi. And in order to survive, they have to select the issues of confrontation and issues where they would like to remain silent. So that's the reason why this Mohalla Clinic and there are many other things like, for instance, opening of school, etc. So I think that on case to case basis, they have decided to go by case to case basis. So, uh, for instance, MCD elections are around the corner. So therefore, uh, what would be beneficial for both? They would remain silent on that. And the issues where both would like to score point against each other would be very different and they would take that sort of a position on those issues. So I think this case to case base approach is something which is important to understand the politics of Aam Aadmi Party at the moment. And remember that Aam Aadmi Party uh, is also a party of victims. It has its own politics of victimhood. So therefore, we have to revisit the ways in which the idea of victimhood is interpreted both by Mr. Kejriwal in relation to uh, Narendra Modi's national victimhood. So I think that, you know, this, again, this is competitive victimhood, which I have tried to explain in my presentation. This competitive victimhood is to be seen with regard to the legal framework, which is evolving at the moment where the, the power of the state are curtailed. And, you know, uh, Amadmi party is fully aware that they cannot get rid of this. So in a different situation, they have to survive. And in this survival mode, they have realized that there, are, there would be certain issues on which there would be no confrontation. And there would be issues where they would like to play from, at the front foot. Hilal sir, uh, actually I'd like to ask uh, what this uh, my uh, the intent behind the question was. So like let's say that Mohalla Sabha, that is one framework or that is one structure where, uh, you know, uh, like the original intention was that there will be some amount of money that will be allocated to a Mohalla and Mohalla will have that power to uh, disburse that money for whatever projects that they want. So sir, I want to know that there is no one in this जो all over country कुछ हैं जहाँ पे citizens जो हैं वो governance में participate कर रहे हैं election के अलावा नहीं बहुत मुश्किल है नहीं it is difficult to tell you any any sort of example of this kind see this whole business of uh, panchayat must be seen from the the manner in which different form of centralization is is produced. Remember that Panchayati Raj was actually inserted in a new framework in the name of decentralization. So therefore, whenever we think of direct participation of people, I think we must remember that the whole structure of Panchayati Raj is inextricably linked to the centralization centralization that is already given to us. So we cannot think of Panchayati Raj outside the centralization thing. That's one thing. Second is that if you look at, uh, I have written an article yesterday in India Today, where it is about the Muslim vote, etc., in which I have tried to show that the basic point of contact for a person is Panchayat or municipality. Now, Panchayat and Muslim uh, municipalities are the sites where technically there should be no role for political party of the national status. But in, in practice, political parties, certainly there are people who, who, who would be the politically, who would like to go up. And they are the people who are basically constituting the nature of power structure at the local level. 
So you have to obviously rely on the national election in order to get things done at the local level. So it is next to impossible to think of or to see this Mohalla clinic or the Mohalla Sabhas as direct participation. No, these things are inextricably linked for the center. And you know, remember, look, look at what Kejriwal has done in Delhi. Uh, they started with the experiment called uh, that we will take opinion of people on virtually everything. But after some time, that completely gone. So everything is so centralized within the, the realm of Amandi party. And we should not blame these individuals because the structure of political party and the overall structure of the uh, centralization in the realm of politics is this, that if you want to be a political party, you have to follow certain logic of centralization. So therefore, these experiments should be interpreted in the realm of actual politics. So we'll end this session now. Um, thank you, Professor Hilal Mehmet for a wonderful talk and uh, responding to questions in pretty detailed manner. Thank I mean, you. covered a range of issues on victimhood, justice, satyagraha, and you know, uh, very complex questions. So I would like to thank you for this talk. And I would also like to thank my colleague, Sasang, who organized this uh, talk and my other colleagues like uh, um, you know, Rakesh Ranjan, Dr. Pinak Sarkar, and uh, uh, Mr. Neeraj Kumar and Mr. Mukesh. Uh, and especially I would like to thank my chairperson of our center, Professor Puspendra Kumar, who has always been very generous in uh, giving us the freedom to invite people of uh, different ideological persuasions. Uh, thank you, Professor Puspendra. Um, so before we end this, I think Professor Puspendra would like to make an announcement and yeah. we'll end with that announcement. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you, Charvak. And again, thank you, Dr. Hilal Ahmad, for agreeing to deliver this lecture. Uh, I have a, one announcement. This is uh, about uh, the next lecture, which is uh, Professor Hitkar Jha Memorial Lecture, the fifth lecture in his memory. And this will be delivered on 5th March by uh, Professor Parul Bhandari. And she will be speaking on mythical love and conjugality in everyday life, gender and politics in India. We will uh, write to you. I will send email to all of you so that uh, you get the, uh, the time and date and also the link for this, uh, this lecture. And uh, you can access uh, all other lectures in this series on injustice, uh, on, on justice and also our lecture series on migration and, uh, and Hitkulja Memorial Lectures uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, just search for this Patna Center and you will find the YouTube channel of this Patna. And, and even this lecture was also live streamed. So you can, if you want, you can revisit. Uh, somebody has asked for a uh, PowerPoint presentation of Dr. Hilal Ahmad. If I get, then we can share it. Otherwise, sure, sure. it's there yeah, on the YouTube channel and the lecture you can, you can see. So we'll end here. Thank you very much.